Espera, we are, we are live now. Okay. Am I audible, sir? Uh, you are perfectly audible. Okay. Yeah. Myself, Saika Khan, extend a warm welcome to everyone present over here. To start off the proceedings, I would like to invite Professor Muhammad Ahmed for the recitation of few verses from Hodi Quran. Am I audible? Yes, sir. You are audible. Okay. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغزوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين Translation In the name of Allah, the gracious, the merciful Praise, to be, praise be to Allah, Lord of the world The most gracious, the most merciful Master of the day of judgment It is you we worship And upon you we call for help Guide us to the straight path, the path of those you have blessed, not of those against whom there is anger, nor of those who are misguided. Sadaqallahul Aliyul Azim. The webinar on making artificial intelligence real, use cases for applied AI, is an initiative by Anjuman Islam to break the complex myths around artificial intelligence and make it easily consumable for our students. We are honored today with the presence of Mr. Faisal Ghadiali and Mr. Shabbir Bharmal. Mr. Faisal has over 20 plus years of industrial experience. Currently, he is a partner at Price Water House Coopers, PwC Washington, USA, and working as Deputy CTO at Oracle Corporation. He is a regular speaker at industry events like Oracle Open World. He has worked in companies like Tata Infotech, Fujitsu Consulting, and Capgemini. Mr. Shabbir Bharmal, he is working as a Chief Product Officer at Lidos. He has over 20 plus years experience in commercial, government management and technology consulting experience. He has served as the Chief Technology Officer for Lidos, Lockheed Martin's Health and Life Sciences Group and managed large federal accounts and delivered mission critical capabilities to US federal and state governments and international government agencies like Ministry of Justice in UK. Now I request Mr. Faisal to please start the session. Please welcome, sir. Thank you, Saika. Appreciate that. And um, uh, hello all, I'm just gonna share my screen. Um, and I, I want to make sure that uh, you can see it. Uh, Dr. Uh, Sharik, uh, are you able to see my screen? Yes, yes, Professor. Okay, yes. excellent, excellent. Uh, hello, hello, all, and uh, welcome to this session. I'm, uh, my name is Faisal Ghadiali. I'm very excited to be uh, presenting to you today. Um, what I think uh, Dr. Saika left out was that I'm a proud alumni of uh, Sabu Siddiq, and I graduated in 1986. Um, uh, it, it was a pleasure to be able to talk to, to you today. Uh, it brings back not only a lot of memories, uh, but also a lot of nostalgia about uh, uh, many happy days in, in that institute. Um, <clears throat> uh, Shabdar and I are going to present, and as we were discussing this yesterday, um, we, uh, we, we felt that uh, the, uh, it's Friday evening for you, uh, 5.35 in the evening, and yet another virtual video session. And I know how enjoyable that is to all of us. We've all had long weeks and it feels like a very long year uh, with, uh, with staring at our computer screen. So really we were, we were gonna have a very structured agenda as you see on the top of the screen, you know, we would give you some knowledge, gyan about emerging technologies, artificial intelligence and all of that. And we said, you know, we've, we're not gonna enjoy this and you are most probably just gonna feel like, well, Here's one more lecture for us, right? So we're gonna change it completely. <laughs> we want this to be like what we would, Shabir and I would do at 5.30 evening on a Friday. We would go to the canteen or go to the chai, chai store, um, stand outside, uh, get a plate of samosas and just talk, 
right? Just just have an open discussion and and just exchange ideas. And that's what we want this to be, right? So at, at this point, if you want to go get your chai cup or just get a plate of samosas, which I, by the way, love, uh, feel free. This is this is a f- informal, casual discussion. We just want to share with you uh, all the wonderful things that are happening in AI. Uh, so with that, uh, it's going to be a, a very interactive, and uh, you know, please feel free to post a lot of questions so we can answer those for you as well. Um, I want to start with. Uh, you know, I, I think you heard my titles, but I want you to know who I am. And who I am is that little picture in the bottom left-hand corner. Uh, that is me lying down on the grass, exhausted, after trying to dig <coughs> a pit uh, where I would plant my vegetables. And this happened in March of this year. Uh, and I said, you know, I'm going to start growing tomatoes. I will grow lettuce and I will grow potatoes. I just want to be a farmer. And I said, how hard can that be? So (laughs) despite my wife telling me I'm crazy, I took the shovel and went outside and started digging. I dug for two hours. I dug two feet by two feet. And then I collapsed. And I realized how hard farming can be. Uh, So that is me. I'm I'm a new farmer. Uh, I did succeed in growing some tomatoes. Uh, In in fact, way too many tomatoes. It's amazing how much one plant of tomatoes can, can give you tomatoes. Uh, my neighbors are sick of receiving onions from me. These onions don't stop growing. Uh, so I, it's that, that, that's, that's what is happening in my life right now. I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, Shabir, can you do a brief introduction as well? Shabir can't hear you. Uh, Shabir, you're on mute. Can you guys hear me? Perfect. Please go ahead, Shabir. Okay, fantastic. Okay, let's let's begin again. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, Ms. Saika, thank you for the warm welcome. Uh, it's absolutely my pleasure to be here. Uh, I think it's up, almost up to like 20 plus years that I'm kind of talking to people from Sabu, so it kind of feels very close. Um, on the same note of like, you know, as engineers, we kind of always try to like, you know, do something better and keep upskilling and keep learning, right? So along that same thread, you know, this pandemic uh, has forced us to up- upskill. Uh, so while you guys are kind of looking at from an AI and machine learning standpoint, for me, it was like, you know, let's get down to the basics. We've started a small garden, but I'm more interested in the cooking part of it. So I think I've kind of done my fair share of cooking during the pandemic. Uh, and in all honesty, I had to kind of have some evidence, right? You know, in engineering and data science, everything is database. So this picture is evidence for everybody, especially my wife, to know that I can cook. And for me to make rotis, especially bhajaraka rotis, is one of the most difficult things to do. And I think I'm kind of mastering it. But my wife said, you know what? I think you've kind of become a master at this. So uh, just just like everybody on this call, most of you are engineers and, you know, uh, visual uh, data scientists and things like that, learning and continuous learning is in our blood. So uh, welcome, you know, I'm kind of pretty happy that we are kind of having this conversation. Thanks, thanks, Shabir, and uh, appreciate that introduction. And I'm sure you're eating that bajra roti with jam, yeah. uh, as, as, as we know. Uh, um, th- there is one more uh, introduction I will make, uh, just, just for, um, uh, it will not be a speaker, but I just want to make that introduction. I'm extremely proud uh, to have a group captain from the Indian Air Force, uh, Arif Patel, on this uh, uh, call. Uh, he's listening to this uh, presentation as well. Arif Patel was a peer, uh, is a peer of ours uh, through Sabu Siddiq, uh, but now he's uh, he's in active duty in the Indian Air Force and uh, wanted to just acknowledge uh, Arif Patel um, and our immense pride in him uh, in, and what he does. So thank you for being here. All right, with that, let us move to what is uh, what do you think when you think of AI? And uh, th- this is typically a, a, a word cloud that pops up when, when we ask this question. And uh, th- so some of the terms pop up very <clears throat> immediately. Uh, artificial intelligence means robotics. It means machine learning. Uh, it means something intelligent, something smart. Um, uh, it's it's going to change the world, you know, uh, those kinds of things. But what, you know, it's, it's going to be the Siri, it's the Alexa of the world, uh, Amazon Alexa, and so on. Uh, but if you see in the bottom uh, right-hand corner, uh, there is that word called working. Uh, and it's not about 
working in the context of how we work. It's in the context of, does it really work? And, and that right now in the AI space is an area of, of very deep interest because uh, there are a lot of ideas uh, and very good ideas. Uh, and some of the ideas we see, uh, you, you know, you see videos of them and, and the news articles about them. But what does not work is when you scale it, when you want to do the same thing a hundred times, a thousand times, that's when the technology starts to creak. Uh, the other aspect when we say, is it, does it actually work, is the uh, ability for it to be more accurate. The highest accuracy you get with AI right now in general, I, I use that term, you, you are very happy if you hit 60%. 60, 70% accuracy is, is considered great, but that means that 30% of the time you are wrong and, uh, or, or not you are wrong, the artificial intelligence solution or the uh, result from AI is wrong. And think about it, <clears throat> if, if you had um, a robot doctor giving you medicine and the doctor said, yes, you know, I, you, it'll do all of this automatically. And by the way, 70% of the time you will live, but 30% you will die. Will you go to that doctor, right? So, so that, is, that is where the paradigm of AI is right now. It's, it's an evolving, exciting space. Um, but for it, and as engineers, we look at it as, can I make it real? Uh, does it actually work? Can it do something meaningful for us? Uh, that is the space in which there is a lot of interest right now. And what I think we will share uh, over the next few minutes um, in this presentation is where it has become real, where it actually works. Uh, and the intent is that you get ideas about how this can be applied in even newer spaces, right? Because in, in, in this one technology, um, uh, unlike, um, unlike in the past, uh, you, the, the limits of where you can apply it are only limited by our creativity, right? Uh, and and I, we will reach a point where our creativity will also not be enough. And to the machines to, to get more creative. Um, all right, so with that, I want you to, we are gonna try to do something. I want to use this, uh, this is a word cloud uh, that was generated by a prior uh, group of people. Uh, I'd like to generate a word cloud based on your feedback. So over the next two minutes, three minutes, if you can in the comment section of YouTube, put a word uh, or, or put, put a, uh, ideally if you can put words about where you have seen AI being used. So, you know, you could say things like Alexa or, or, or Siri or automated car, right? Just, just put uh, words about where you feel AI has been uh, deployed successfully and uh, we'll, um, uh, we, we'll most probably generate a word cloud out of it. Uh, so, so you know, take, take a, oh, I'll keep talking, but just put, put, some, put some comments in, the, uh, in your YouTube feed. All right, with that, let's move forward with... Um, uh, Oh, okay. I, I think, uh, th thank you, Bandanwas, for putting it in this chat on the Zoom. Uh, I, I'd prefer if you could put it on the YouTube chat. Um, I, I think the students are also, but I will use this. Thank you so much. Um, all right. So le let's, uh, before we move into just, I, I, I do want to baseline us. I, I did say I will not give you too much theory and I will not. Uh, but I, I do want us to baseline. So the next few minutes, we're all talking from the same kind of uh, level field. And uh, at a very high level, this is what is artificial intelligence. So let, let's just take a step back and say, what are we trying to do here, right? And as, a, as, as humans, we kind of, when we actually say we are doing something, we are actually doing three things here. We are sensing our environment. Uh, you know, we are, we are feeling something. We feel the, the stove is hot or things like that. Um, we then think about it. Uh, what am I doing with these inputs? Uh, and then based on completing that thought process, you then take action. Right. So in a very, very general category, there is sensing, uh, which is understanding what is happening in the environment, thinking, which is taking what I just sensed, uh, trying to understand it. And that understand part is typically in the context of where have I seen this before? How do I map this to something that I'm familiar with? Right? That, that is typically what the thinking process is. And then based on that, once you, once you say, oh, I, I know I've done this before and this is what I did as a result of it, you act, right? Uh, and, and, and the sense of acting is, of course, something physical that happens or, or in our case is something that happens in, in logic. But uh, th that's really what we are trying to do. And we do that automatically. You know, right now I'm taking, I'm looking at my screen, I'm sensing it, 
right? I'm understanding in my head, this is what I want to tell you about. And then in that fraction of a second after that, I am telling you something, right? That, that's all happening here. Um, to make a machine do that is incredibly hard. But if you break it down, which, which humans tend to do very well, we have solved parts of this uh, uh, pipeline. <laughs> so when you look at the sensing part of it, and if you look back in the last two, three, maybe even five years, we've got really good at putting sensors out there. And by, by sensors, I mean not just sensing what the temperature is or uh, you know, how, uh, how, how much water is there. Those are, those are mechanical sensors to a sense and they're important, but really sensing things that we as humans find important. Right. So in that context, just by knowing the temperature outside is not good enough for me, because when I step out, I don't know whether I'm actually going to feel hot because there might be a breeze that is blowing, which makes it cooler for me. Right. Um, or the ability in our case, we do a lot of our sensing by listening and reading things. Right. That's where we get information from. How do we make machines read things? Right. So natural language processing, computer vision, things like that have developed quite well. They're, they're, they're pretty highly accurate now. And the best part is uh, it, it, now these sensing machines can, uh, uh, can recognize handwriting. So now all my engineering notes that I wrote by hand, which now I cannot read, I can pass it through an NLP program and gives me these nicely formatted notes, which I can share with a lot of people. Of course, they're of no use now, but, <laughs> but anyway, you get the point. Sensing is, is, is a part of AI, which has been well uh, addressed. Thinking is a different domain. In thinking, what we are trying to do is come up with a model in our mind, which says, how, how do I go through a decision tree in my mind to come out with a conclusion, right? And this is a much harder space because of course it is harder. You're trying to duplicate how you think, right? Um, and there are a lot of quote unquote models that have been built. And those models are based on deep mathematics, right? So, um, and, and here's the fundamental thing that when we think, uh, it is not like we are doing something very complex in our mind. When we think, we are comparing whatever we are seeing with millions of past experiences and millions of past images. That's, it. That's what's happening. Because when we say somebody is able to think through something, it's because of the richness of their past experience and their ability to correlate. That is critical here. Correlate past experiences. And that is what thinking is. Now try making a machine do that, right? Um, so obviously we've come up with a lot of algorithms and so on, but the key aspect here when it comes to thinking is for a machine to think, uh, it is starting with knowing nothing, right? When, when, when we are asked to think about math, we don't, you immediately have the past experience of differential equation. You have the past experience of algebra. You have the past experience of just plain math, right? And you have the experience of what happens with math. Right? So if, if there are three slices of pizza and there are four people, you just know that there is a problem. Nobody needs to tell you that, right? Um, but for a machine to understand that is, is a lot harder. Sorry, I'll, I'll rephrase my metaphor. When there are three pieces of samosas and four people, then there is a problem. Uh, otherwise, pizza, there isn't a problem. Uh, anyway, but that, that, is, that is where, that is where you know, thinking comes in. And here, there is a lot of current development. There is a lot of research. And there is, I think, a huge opportunity for us to participate uh, because this is an evolving field right now. And finally comes the, fee, the, the field of ACT. ACT is actually simpler to do because once you, the thinking is done and a solution is given, acting on that is simpler to do. But trusting it is, is in a completely different domain, right? Um, and you're seeing examples there of, you know, game, gaming and things like that. Areas that don't really have a material impact. But would you give the output of this thinking to something that put people's lives at stake? Right? That is where the league is, it changes. And you are now getting into the aspect of, do I really trust this thing? But independent of trust, does it actually work? And that, that is what we'd call the future state. So for example, our automated cars, right? Uh, machine, uh, machine driven automated cars. That's why it is so hard, right? Um, okay, so with, with, with that, that sense, think, act, I think you, you have a sense of where we are coming from. Uh, and all of this is used in the examples that you'll see coming uh, forward, right? And very briefly, I wanna spend time on these two aspects at the bottom of this, what you see here, software development versus AI development or machine learning. Um, it is very different and here is why. Uh, with software development, you completely control the logic, right? You, you give it some inputs, there is logic that runs and it generates an output. You look at the output and you can validate 
if the logic worked right because you know when you give the input what output you are expecting uh the, the algorithm here as you see input data plus our algorithm equals output data algorithm is written by you and is controlled by you uh and the output is very controlled in machine learning it is turned around uh, and, and this is why when we say i'm going to start programming in machine learning uh people kind of react a little differently because you are not really programming and let me explain that what you are doing with machine learning is you are saying here is a set of inputs and here is what here is the output here is what happens when that input is processed and here is the output that comes out of it now you mr machine figure out what is the model what is the algorithm so when you are quote unquote programming in machine learning you are actually not writing the algorithm all you are doing is giving the machine a set of inputs and a set of outputs and letting the machine come up with the algorithm and this is another aspect of ai which is important to be aware of ai needs a lot of data you can't give three rows of inputs and three rows of outputs and expect an algorithm that is going to be accurate you need thousands hundreds of thousands millions of records as inputs and millions of records as outputs to then have an algorithm that really can predict or give you an output that you can use right uh, so i just wanted to kind of set that baseline here and now let's do something fun now that we've done 5 minutes of theory um let's go, i'm going to try to go to the feed uh, the youtube feed here and pick up the comments all right awesome we got we got a good number of oh uh, all right so i'm going to take these comments here uh starting from chatbots and um let's just take that i'm going to put it in here <clears throat> let's put all these comments in here and now let's just um create a word cloud out of it all right up and large and let's see what we got got okay name. we got name we got so google came up pretty big uh ibrahim and khan were very popular <laughs> but uh, we've got health <laughs> we've got healthcare <laughs> google and khan khan google, google and <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there, there was as the names of people of course have come so let, let's ignore those but i think we've got healthcare we've got learning here we've got facial recognition um uh, netflix is sitting in there so yes good good uh, there seems to be some amount of healthcare there's lens detecting uh so good spread i i think folks what you're what i what i hear from this is um ai is used in a lot of areas uh, i and i was hoping to see this outcome and, and that is true which is you don't really see ai is not limited to just one industry right uh, yeah. but but nice to know that there is a good recognition all around neural networks is there watch is there um uh, so this is nice to see <laughs> all right um okay. the one thing uh, please go ahead thing, yeah yeah that that i think what you touched upon and what we heard from the audience right the learning aspect uh so if you go back to the previous slide where you kind of had your machine learning slide the introduction so when faisal spoke about the machine learning model where your input is like you know millions of data and you kind of use that data to come up with these you know which algorithm has a high probability of success rate um the learning aspect just like we engineers have this constant need of learning up skilling you need to do the same thing with these models right so this input data that you train that you use as a, as a trained data set on these variables that you kind of need to test against you need to constantly update that because if you want these models and algorithms to kind of you know be real time useful because in real time everything changes at splits of seconds so you need to have that ability to kind of allow that input data to get retrained equally fast at times so that's that's an important thing from an ai and machine learning that we need to be aware of that uh, you know once you have something built and you feel extremely confident kudos but the moment you do that the next step you have to start looking at now what are the changing variable factors coming in that we need to kind of again retrain our data set so just like how we as human beings have to constantly think to improve you have we have to kind of you know work on constantly improving these algorithms too yeah thanks shabir um all right so let's let's move to uh, I'll, i'll go through this real quick so let's say we've had we've had dinner right now and i say 
डिनर के बाद लेट्स ईट समथिंग राइट एंड सो आई आई वुड टिपिकली से ठंडा गरम मीठा यू नो सब एंड यू वुड इमीडिएटली नो इन योर माइंड इफ फैसले से ठंडा इट मींस आइसक्रीम और मीठा वुड बी जलेबी और गरम वुड बी वुड बी चाय राइट um that is implicit to you 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 understand that right away those those categories right uh for a machine <laughs> it's not that easy and so what we what, what you're seeing on this screen is there are three big groups uh of of machine learning okay uh and, and i'll keep this really simple but if i uh, on on the right hand side you see this thing called supervised learning and what that means is if i give you a set of blocks that you see in this uh, picture down here right um Uh, and i say uh, uh please distribute these blocks and here are four bags in which you want to distribute the box uh, the blocks i'm implicitly telling you put the red colored blocks in the red colored bag and the green colored blocks in the green colored bag uh, this is something that our 3 4 year olds are typically doing uh our <laughs> our children do uh but it is a form of what we call supervised learning because we are telling them where to do something and then they figure out how to do it right we don't tell them which ones are green blocks but we are telling them where to put the green block okay so that is one aspect of machine learning where we know what the outcome needs to be and we tell the machine to figure that outcome out right so that is that is supervised learning uh, it's important to understand this kind of difference now the next one is unsupervised learning and this is i give you the same set of blocks right and this is typically to kids who are in their uh, first standard or second standard uh, first standard even um and we say um uh, distribute these blocks organize these blocks now we are not saying there is a red bucket a green bucket and an orange bucket we are simply saying distribute the blocks organize the blocks this is typically what happens they will distribute them by color we did not tell them by what they should organize them but they figured that out so based on the blocks that they had they looked at the blocks and said what is the recurring theme here right what what is the best way for me to group these uh, blocks together and so they came up with the idea that grouping them by color was the best way of doing it right uh, they could have grouped it by 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 the number of uh, pegs that are there on it that's also a valid uh, but that is what we call unsupervised learning where we are giving the machine a set of data and no interpretation of that no guidance and saying figure out what you can from this data right uh, so that's unsupervised learning this is also pretty pretty popular and we'll see the examples of where it's being used the last one is what we call reinforcement learning reinforcement learning is is basically the hardest thing to do and this is if i tell you it's raining cats and dogs what will you do you will take an umbrella if you go outside right you you know that saying it's a, by saying it's raining cats cats and dogs it means it's actually raining water uh, a machine has no experience of this it cannot interpret uh, when we use metaphors uh, just like i did right now you know um, uh, about about dessert after dinner machine can't get that right so for the ability to, of a machine to be able to understand context and within that context interpret the data uh, is what is called uh, uh, reinforcement learning and that is the third form of machine learning okay so with that uh, i i i'll take questions at the end but I, i let's get into what are the use cases all right so here's the fun part here so we'll we, we'll go over all three areas right we'll we'll go over supervised learning first then we'll do unsupervised learning and then we'll do reinforcement learning uh so let's start with supervised learning this is a well established field of machine learning uh, and uh, this is a, a lot of these examples i'm personally involved with so I, i'll i'll give you a little bit of detail uh but the one that has been most uh, most popular and has been used for quite a while is fraud detection right uh if you use your credit card uh at a at a certain um, uh, at a certain time in a certain place and within a very short period if it is used in another place the machine you know you know that there is fraud somebody is using your card the wrong way uh if if there is a transaction amount uh, that exceeds a certain regular spend the machine knows that there is fraud and i can tell you that there has been every time i pass through new york uh my 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 card is stolen right i within 2 or 3 hours somebody will make a transaction in kentucky or texas um and and, and the credit card company will catch it they will not stop the tra- they will stop the transaction they will send me a message saying hey your card has been stolen and we are sending you a new card right very useful to me because i don't have to go through the hassle of saying you know my card got stolen but that is an example of supervised learning 
because it's it's not like there are specific thresholds that are being set through the transaction volume and the transaction flow the model has learned what is your typical uh, uh, spend characteristics and when it falls outside those spend characteristics it tells you these are not fixed thresholds it's not saying that if you spend more than 100 rupees there is a fraud right it's not telling you that if you spend uh, 2500 rupees in pune uh, that is fraud but in the combination of transactions it is able to tell whether it's fraud or not right so that's a that is one very popular place where uh, um, you know machine learning supervised learning based fraud detection is done the second is in in the industry uh, large construction projects um, and when i mean large these are large capital projects you know not just a it's not about building a building it is building a entire complex um, uh, there there is a lot of equipment pipes machinery that lies around and what the construction companies have found is that they spend a lot of time trying to figure out where is equipment and moving the equipment around uh, so now using pattern recognition and visual rec- uh, visual recognition techniques we are in now these uh, they, they are able to basically fly drones over their uh, 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 construction site and know where equipment is and are a, the the drone essentially looks at it it's it's a sensing device but then there is a machine learning model in the back end that looking at this picture because remember the picture can be in di- at different height different angles all of that it can say yes your bulldozer is sitting you know at that end of the construction site and this is very useful on, for on site engineering uh, uh, folks because they're not spending time trying to hunt around and sometimes these sites are very big uh, where equipment is using the same model uh, we are now currently in the covid era able to do what we call quality assurance so if a construction project is going on and a contractor says today i put 2 kilometers of pipe i put 2 kilometers of pipe somebody has to go out there and check if 2 kilometers of pipe actually got put in right it's it's hard to do uh, so i i've done one of these projects here for oil and gas uh, industry where uh, the the drones go out three times a day Uh, and these are you know when we're saying pipes and all of this this is in far remote areas they go three times a day they just take pictures and come back uh, through through the ai models that we have you can compare current picture with last picture uh, and you can actually measure how much work got done so how much concrete got poured how much piping got put uh, how many lines of rails got put in um, so and, and it is all done not by a person analyzing these pictures it's happening Uh, you know as part of a machine learning model so it's a effective way of using supervised learning okay uh the third aspect that uh, i've seen is uh, around diagnostics and this is what we call prevent uh, predictive maintenance not preventive but predictive maintenance i'll just bring this to the front um all right so w- what this shows is iot sensors uh, now when i say equipment i'm talking about seriously big equipment right uh, and i'm sorry here some of these examples are a little capital based but it just gives you a sense of where it's being used um uh, or, or factory uh, you know factory machines that are running uh, the, the, all these you know the orange dots that you see is the typical steady run state and then the green dots kind of show something you know oil pressure or uh, voltage consumption or amperes or some something has changed in 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 the 150 200 sensors that are typically there on a modern machine is changing and then as a result of that something breaks right and so these machine uh, now remember the it is not always the same you can't always say that the, if the engine temperature goes up uh, that means something is wrong engine temperature could could go up because the load has increased it's also possible right so there are a lot of combination of factors but these machine learning models we the good thing is we have a lot of data coming from these iot sensors um and it's able to learn so now we are in this mode of what we call predictive maintenance where the uh, the models are able to say that machine is going to fail fail and it's going and it's going to fail because the 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 gauze uh, the the damper is broken it's not just saying it's going to fail it's going to say exactly why it is going to fail and it's also going to be able to tell you 50 times for 50 occasions before this on these 23 machines the same pattern resulted in a damper failure right uh, so it, it's built that in a model and so people use this very aggressively now Uh, to make sure that production lines and all of that don't go down another example of supervised learning and finally covid this is kind of um, uh, uh, should not be a surprise but remember it is not just about data but it is a correlation of data and so uh, uh, 
the the industry right now uh, and of course this map is of the us here but w- what companies want to know desperately is two things will my customers pay their bills when the second wave of covid comes and will my how will my supply chain be impacted when the second wave of covid comes right w- which parts of my supply chain will be impacted they desperately want to know that now there is a lot of what we'll call pro- predictive data not forecast but predictive data uh, from from various medical institutes you know johns hopkins world health organization so what we are able to do is take these public data sets overlay with a with a company's customer database or their supplier uh, transaction flow and we are now able to tell them look based on all of this and this this is based on ai not 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 forecasting techniques but machine learning techniques we are able to say in this county in this zip code 20% of your customers will not be able to pay their bills right or we know that based on these patterns that we've already seen because we've got four months of data behind us at this point we can tell you that your supply chain for these nuts that you need will be will be impacted right so it's it's a powerful way of predicting and see just i keep using the word predicting but isn't that something wonderful um i can look at a graph and say you know if i draw a straight line graph and extend it i can say well in the next two weeks uh, i can tell you what's going to happen because it's it's straight line forecast right but being able to sit back and say four months from now what will happen with 60% accuracy is like magic right so the, it, i i can predict a lot of things <laughs> right based on these uh, the, the the as the and as the accuracy of the prediction goes up you're getting closer to becoming a magician frankly is is where this is going right so you 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 got to keep that in context and so with that here is the estimated life expectancy everybody wants to know how long they will live when am i going to die right uh, and based on my genes based on my environment based on other people who are like me what is my life expectancy uh, so obviously that, that i i think that's a little gimmicky and that that science is a little light but here is my personal example of this when i was learning uh, artificial intelligence um, uh, about a year ago uh, I, i wanted to get into the deep statistical math behind it i was taking a course from stanford uh, and i would study late at night and on the weekends and my young daughter who's who at that time was 8 7 uh, years old was kind of disappointed she's like you know you're not playing with me anymore and you're always studying and you know you come out and tell me all these tell everybody all these wonderful things that i don't understand like what's the point how what does it mean to me so i was like yeah, that's uh, interesting you know her perspective so uh, just fast forwarding this my daughter hates to wait outside for her school bus she she doesn't like to stand outside she when she goes out she wants the school bus to be there uh, so for a month because i used to go to drop her off i recorded the time at which the date uh, the um uh, i should turn off my uh, note the time at which uh, the bus would come you know every day of the week for one month uh, and then i uh, since i was doing a linear regression model i i th- this this data set was very uh, you know complied very well with that i ran it through that model a- and the bus typically comes between 905 and 913 in the morning right and sh- and she wants to get out there as close to the bus time as possible so now after i had done this little bit and kind of validated it i the, she came to me one day i said look i said i can tell you what time your bus is going to come today and she says oh, tell me was awesome i said okay today's tuesday if it is tuesday uh, the bus uh, bus typically will come at 910 and if it is friday the bus will come at 913 or later and she's really happy because actually the bus does come because i overlaid her data with some traffic information and some weather information and it to to within a level of accuracy but we we do know that on some days of the week based on all kinds of things the bus will come late and on some days it will come a little early and she is very pleased with this so now she goes about saying oh machine learning solved my problem right so there are good ways of using this all right let's move on to um and i'm going to wind this up because i want to have some time for question and answer we are moving on to unsupervised learning remember put the blocks based on your understanding and one big area of use i will have to switch this off i'm sorry uh, one big area of use is uh, in data visualization you don't realize it but when you give all this data to charts and the charts show it there's a lot of math that's happening behind it right uh, and now if you see the charts are clickable so if you click on a section of a chart it drills down into deeper sections and if you click into that it goes even deeper that aspect of data visualization is something that is actually being served up through unsupervised learning 
the 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 algorithms at the back and these are algorithms they're not, they're not uh, programs they know how to look at this data they quickly understand the correlation between this data and stagger it up for you then you are doing a supervised learning step you're saying no 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 i don't want to see it by year i want to see it by month right it understands that and redoes the whole math on the fly for you so without you realizing it you are actually using unsupervised learning uh, when you are doing data visualization uh recommender systems uh, th this is something that uh, i'll just give you the example uh, firms want to my firm we know 3 months before an employee will leave the firm we know and this is completely based on unsupervised learning based on the the the, the, the you know thousands and millions of records that we have based on employee profiles uh and of course there is proprietary information here but we 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 know when a resource is going to leave the firm uh and we sell this platform to to other um organizations because it's not like big brother but it is humans are very predictable in the workplace <laughs> and, um so an example of unsupervised learning the other one that you must be very familiar with is auto correct right you start typing something i love to use auto correct because i have to use less uh, i have to type less uh but how many people are you executing well actually you're trying to say how many people are you expecting right but that that's a that's a nice example of the unsupervised learning algorithm trying to learn from you next time it won't make that mistake remember that you know every time i um i used to type out faisal which is my name uh, on the on the uh, in my text you know when it, uh, it would always auto correct that to fail safe right fail safe was faisal was fail safe uh, and then after the first two weeks of me changing fail safe back to faisal it figured out uh, this is a valid word i got to use it right that's unsupervised learning um uh, one quick example i'll give here uh, is uh, uh, in the recent past i i converted two systems um a uh, very large number of transactions 20 million transactions between two systems and we had to reconcile because we moved something from one system and moved it into another system the systems themselves were very different the reports that came out from the systems were very different and i had 20 million rows uh, resulting in about 1 billion dollars of transactions and in that 1 billion dollars of transactions there was a difference of 5000 dollars and these were you know a lot of financial transactions we cannot move forward until we reconcile those why is there a difference of 5000 dollars so i had a team of 5 6 people who were going to go through all the reports because the reports from one system and the other system were completely different structures were different uh and and try to figure I and mean, they would have eventually done it but using a lot of excel magic they were they were going to try to figure out where that difference came from um in parallel i asked a, a data scientist uh, 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 to to use the gc the global uh, uh, google google compute engine uh and 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 use just unstructured data unsupervised learning and throw these two large data sets onto that platform and come up with an answer uh i was expecting you know my team the the team that was doing it manually to take about 3 weeks to do it um and we were going through after two days the 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 data scientist person comes back to me and says here are the 80 records that don't match right i give those 80 records to the to the team that was analyzing they go down and look into those specific 80 transactions bang that that's where the difference was they were able to they were able to reconcile the data scientist had no clue he did not know what was the data he was dealing with he had no idea but the gce engine using unsupervised learning was able to figure out the correlationships and after figuring out the correlationship was able to identify where the difference was right so just phenomenal power of the machine to be able to do that all right and now i wind up with just the fun part of things this is the reinforcement learning this is where this is uh, not really fully available yet but a lot of fun things are happening so uh, reinforcement learning is i actually have to give you the context and you have to learn within that context right uh, and gaming is a big you know every time the the machine does beat somebody at chess or beat somebody at sudoku um or whatever new game there is that's reinforcement learning it's exciting a machine is doing better than a human awesome you know uh, but uh, you know the, this example that you see here about sudoku being solved by by the machine i think is a is a very interesting project to do uh, it takes a combination of visual recognition because you're pointing your sudoku at the uh, at the camera it has to recognize the numbers then it has to go through this algorithm of of figuring out 
and then giving you the answer, right? Uh, but th th this is, uh, it, it, it's fun. But I just wanted to give you an example of what happening, what is happening behind this reinforcement learning. Automated driving, right? All the, it has to understand the entire, the car has to understand the entire environment and act based on that, right? So that is, you know, automated driving. Uh, and an area where people are making money on this is, uh, which is currently happening is in what we call, um, uh, real-time trading. And this is not buying stock today and then selling it tomorrow. The, you know, not even buying it within microseconds and, and, and seconds, you know, you buy and sell, buy and sell. Humans are not going to do that. That whole process behind that is being uh, automated. You know, humans can always figure out a way to make money. So uh, this, this uh, very short-term, very high-speed trading is being driven by, by artificial intelligence. All right, so with that, I want to hand it over to Shabir. Shabir, please go ahead. You know, next 10 minutes are yours. Uh, please give a perspective on, on the industry. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. Uh, so the next couple of slides, I'm going to focus more on the healthcare space and maybe a little bit of um, you know, one on the defense side. Um, just from a time standpoint, I'll see if I can wind this up rather quickly. So we all know that uh, you know, every human, the moment they're born, you know, health for every human is critical. Right. But sometimes uh, care for the health of any person can either be preventive or it can be, you know, if there's something that you have in your genes, you just cannot control it. And uh, so drug development is kind of extremely critical. And uh, in decades back, it used to take almost 10 to 20 years, 10 years even to kind of get it to the, you know, the clinical trials of the first stage, second stage, so on and so forth. But by the time you actually get it in the market from a, for a blockbuster, it can take all the more than 20 years. Now, because of these, you know, one learned data sets on how compounds react with other compounds, how compounds react with the chemical compounds within the proteins of our cells, we've kind of cut that down to like less than two to seven years. And, you know, it would be uh, unwise to talk about with the current situation on the pandemic, you know, the, the belief is that all the data that's coming in from these various countries on uh, the WHO on, you know, what's happening with uh, the virus, data from the output of those virus and the uh, people are kind of being given to the life science companies to use for this drug development. That's the only reason we are talking about having some kind of vaccine or even the first formula of vaccine may be coming out in a year, which is unheard of. It takes years to get that. And this is only possible because of AI and machine learning. Uh, the other one is, you know, healthcare payments is a big fraud. It's kind of rapid fraud. At the same time, on the flip side, uh, you know, healthcare for everybody is always spoken of from, from a, you know, everybody should have the basic health needs irrespective of the country you are in. Um, but payments for healthcare, we all know people come from various socioeconomic backgrounds. The impact of paying for the healthcare basic needs is a big question. There are companies out there as well as capabilities from a uh, predicting payments based on certain illness and based on certain demographic or social uh, factors is kind of coming into play. What does that mean for us, right? So if you know that, you know, like in, maybe in a village, uh, you do not have uh, very affluent people, but they need healthcare. But you know that if we can get a community engagement going for these basic needs, this is where you will have the most bang for the buck. And then if you if you might go to a city, you might have people who are actually willing to donate funds so that you know that can take place. So you can actually now do population health management and outcomes around those based on certain cities so that the care is kind of equitable across all factors in all places. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not just a technical conversation that AI and you know, life science is coming to play, but it's really the well-being of, of communities and people. Uh, next slide, please. You know, going with some of the other use cases around uh, uh, deep learning and supervised learning. Like in deep learning now, we are looking at precision medicine coming out uh, in the forefront. And what I mean by that is in certain diseases like your cancer or oncology treatments, the care plans that come into play are extreme, you know, sometimes pretty uh, lengthy and very, very expensive. You're talking about a tablet sometimes costing over $100,000 for a single tablet. But now what if you can have that tablet 
made just for you. And what I mean by that is based on your genetic composition, you have companies that are looking at these compounds on this uh, you know, chemo tablet that is needed will be most effective because this is how it will interact with your genetic composition versus having a tablet that is looking at the general public and saying this is how it's going to be, uh, you know, it might be less effective. So that's where it becomes very valuable. Um, and on the flip side, you know, away from precision medicine is, you know, this kind of talks about the, the prediction side of uh, the conversation, right? Where if based on your family history, your medical history, you have a predisposition to certain, uh, uh, you know, like diseases, like heart conditions or whatever it might be, we can let you know, you know, sometimes even by the age of 45 or by the uh, 80, a 50 or 60% chance that you might be getting some kind of a heart condition. So if you knew that, if, 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 if there was a way to predict that and, you know, make an impact to your lifestyle now, 20 years prior to that, wouldn't that kind of almost eliminate at some times, even minimize the impact because sometimes if it is a genetic condition you know there is something that you cannot do about it but you can still over time using lifestyle and the right choices kind of change that so uh, we've seen certain use cases of companies you know actually getting a lot of this health data and there's a lot of data but they're now using that data converting it into information for us to kind of put these algorithms in there to kind of make some training choices that, you know, we've seen that, uh, you know, your intake, your blood pressure, this is what's taking place. In fact, sometimes even like, you know, if you are, if you are, uh, if you are able to volunteer, people are actually able to even kind of get their blood test on a regular basis to, to see that depending on what you eat after a certain hours, this is what happens to the composition. And this is what happens to the condition of quote unquote of your, of the fluids in the, in your system. And it will tell you that, you know, how can you make it better or how can you avoid that? Uh, a, a good story that I've heard about is, you know, um, an old lady was kind of, uh, you know, she stayed alone, uh, she fell down and, you know, she just could not reach to pick up a phone, but suddenly she was happy to hear kind of an ambulance come over and uh, unknown to her, she was wearing an eye watch and that eye watch, her son actually turned on the fall detection sensor on. So it's amazing how things like that in the daily lives are known to you can be helpful. But at the same time, you know, the same thing happened to somebody who was doing burpees at home and exercising. So you, you know, that's where we have to kind of make sure that while the data set is kind of getting uh, set up for these uh, supervised learning, you have to constantly feed and train the data set so that when conditions are on the 30% failure or the 20% failure, they can be course corrected. Um, Faisal, next slide. So I think before I, uh, before I kind of talk about this use case, uh, I, I think I'm, I'm sure it's kind of uh, about time for people to kind of get the, either the second set of samosas or chai. Um, but this is, this is pretty close to me because uh, you know, a few years back when AI ML was coming out, uh, you know, I kind of took a nano degree on it and it was just an eye opener to me in terms of there is so much of learning as, as human beings that we have to do to kind of understand what is AI, what is ML, what is deep learning, you know, how do we make not just an algorithm, the basic algorithm, which is different from a, a Kind of an analytical algorithm, but kind of make it learn on itself. Uh, you know, a few years back, we all heard about how uh, I think it was 1996, IBM Deep Blue beat uh, you know the, the then chess champion Kasparov. Ten years later, we heard the story about how AlphaGo beat the top Go player, and Go is kind of almost like 80 times more complex than chess. So now we're talking about these computers getting a little bit smarter. And in just three years, like, you know, 2017, right? In three years, we're talking about like in 2020, just a couple of weeks back, we, we kind of heard about how alpha dogfight, which is kind of a, uh, a simulation, not real, for aerial combat exercises. And this is where an AI model beat one of the best fighter pilots. Uh, so now, you know, fighter pilots go to years and years of school. I mean, it's just, just not, like, you know, sitting in a college and learning, but, and I know my friend over here 
Arif will attest to it. It's a lot of mental and physical training that, that these pilots have to go through. And it doesn't end there. Once you become a pilot, there's still more training to do with depending on which, which you know, uh, plane you're uh, kind of learning to fly and stuff like that. But then AI was able to do that and not only beat the top best player in kind of within three years. So this is just the tip of the iceberg. I think there's a lot more learning that's happening. A uh, few factors that is contributing to this kind of exponential learning is, you know how we take normally 18 years to kind of go from you know primary school, middle school to college. That that time period for human beings is typically maybe 17, 18 years, right? But for a machine, it's reducing because of the compute power that we have, because of the ability with all this data and data sets. So as an engineer, what I would recommend for you guys is, you know, you will definitely be building AI, machine learning. I mean, there's no question about it. If you're not gonna build it, you're gonna be using it. So getting extremely comfortable with AI, machine learning, deep learning has to be in our DNA now. Um, and Faisal, if you go to the next slide. Oh. So I know before we get into questions, uh, the, the, the one thing I wanna kind of make sure we all uh, that we've not spoken about as part of the use cases is the, 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 in the data models that are trained, a big challenge that we have to work through. And this is where, you know, the engineers, this is kind of a big opportunity for you guys to work in. We use a lot of data sets that are available out in the public, but a lot of these data sets and data models are fresh with bias, right? So we have to figure out how do we get these data sets cleaner? How do we get it better? So that when these algorithms come out at the end, you know, it's not 70%, but it's like 90% and it's 90% accurate. A case in point is in, 29, in 2016, when Microsoft AI chatbot, Ty, if you remember, if you guys, some of you guys may remember, they, you know, Microsoft said, let's just put this chatbot out on Twitter and let's see what it learns from Twitter. In less than 24 hours, the good chatbot that it became like, how are you? Hope you're having a great day. By the end of the day, it kind of became, quote unquote, you know, pretty racist. And anybody's talking to it kind of, you know, came back with pretty negative thoughts. So, so it's all up to us how we feed these data models, how we train these. Uh, so while machine is going to be, you know, they're taking control of our lives, we still control it. But I think we should be good for some questions. All right. Thanks, uh, Shabir. Uh, so I'll, I'll just move forward and thank you for your comments on the YouTube stream. Uh, it, I know there is a lot of discussion around this. So we want to give you um, something to continue this conversation. This is the forum for AI discussions. So it's an open public uh, forum just for our, Carl uh, Sekar and, uh, and Sabu and basically Hello. Anjuman uh, uh, resources. So uh, please go to that Google group Hello. and post questions and Hello. we'll respond. Um, and then the second part is the, please look in Apple Store or Google Play. This is a gift from us to you. Uh, this is an app that will help you both learn AI and keep you informed about new AI. The code, uh, the code to use is Learn All. Uh, R L R N A L L. Uh, this is actually a paid app, but uh, we are, we're gifting this code to you. So please uh, feel free to use it and share it with others, and it'll be a great place to uh, for you to learn new things. The the term that you want to search for is digital fitness assessment. All right, with that, nine o'clock, uh, sorry, six o'clock your time. Uh, ta ta uh, <laughs> uh, the chai store most probably is closing now. Um, uh, Dr. Sharik and team, I'll turn it back to you. Sorry, we ran a little over. Great. Uh, I think uh, Professor Irfan can look at the, 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 the chat and, and you can start to call it if any, any questions or not. Uh, and it's uh, for students who are participating, it's, it's open now. Um, I think uh, both Faisal and uh, Shabir, uh, I have really spoken in depth about their experiences with AI and it is phenomenal as to what uh, they've been doing around. It's fairly cutting edge science. Um, so the, it's, it's, the floor is open. Um, I request uh, Professor Irfan to kind of moderate the questions if there are any. Uh, for students also to can they post the questions. Um, the faculty also kind of free to post their questions in the Zoom chat box.
Actually, Dr. Sharik, I was uh, I've been responding to the comments on the YouTube, um, so I think some of the questions were answered there. Uh, okay. But I think mo most the, the bigger questions there were. <laughs> I think there were two themes. One is how do we learn more, and I think this this app that I uh, encourage folks to go to that's a good starting spot, and also the discussion forums. Um, there's so much information. The second was this uh, very philosophical argument about if AI and machines become better than humans, is it good um and uh boy that is a very hard it's, it's not a question you can answer yes or no but uh there is a whole field called responsible ai uh, that actually is starting to deal with that right? the, the, the question is very appropriate um and and maybe as faculty and, and students uh, something to, to to think about uh, yes professor Irfan, i think that Two or three questions have popped up. Can you talk about them? Uh, I think uh, there are two questions. One Carl talks about, you know, the currently the field where AI can be the most effective um, will be. I, I think AI space will pretty much pervade uh, everything that we see around in some shape or form. You want to expand on that, Faisal? Uh, yeah, um, yeah, I think uh, uh, there's no specific field, but I think fields that have a lot of data uh, and a lot of historical data, which is easily accessible, are the biggest candidates. So weather forecasting is an example where you know AI is very powerful. As Shabir pointed out, healthcare field uh, is another space where there is a lot of data and it can result in a lot of human good. Um, and then beyond that, I think th there is, of course, the commercial space um, but I, I truly believe it is open to the imagination. If the if the if the faculty were to close their ears, I could tell the students that you could use AI to do something very interesting with your uh, questions papers. And if the students were to close their ears, I would say faculty, there is a very interesting uh, use case for using natural language processing for evaluating papers. So <laughs> it can be used everywhere, basically. <laughs> Shabir, you're on mute. Okay, I think, so one of the questions asked was, can AI be more smarter than humans, right? And this is this has been kind of a, a, a highly contested, highly debatable topic right now. Um, today, if you were to ask a lot of uh, industry experts, uh, AI can only be as smart as humans want it to be. Okay, we are we actually building the we are providing a data we are providing the logic. So just like you know when 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 we are born you know our parents teach us quote unquote the culture the the rules you know what is the definition of good what is the definition of bad. The same thing is being now being sensed and taught and acted upon by machines. So who's feeding that? That's us, right? So what we have to be, we have to be extremely aware of what data is being fed, how clean the data is. So, uh, if, I mean, in, in summary, AI cannot be smarter than humans as long as humans feed it the right stuff. Um, so that's, that's where I would leave it. At the same time, I. I do want us to know that, you know, use AI machine learning to enable our lives, right? It's, it's, it's making our lives better. It's making us more smarter. Like we don't want AI to control us. We want to control AI. So we want to use it smartly, not for them to make us more dumb. Thanks, See, there was, there was one question about what is the difference between AI and machine learning? Um, so the way I would I would uh, categorize it, and I think Faisal touched upon it a little bit earlier in the in, in the session, is think about AI. Everything about what you want the machine to do. That's artificial intelligence. You're giving intelligence to the machine or the system, so you're telling it what it should do. Machine learning is now where you're telling the machine to think for itself. Right? The machine is learning on its own based on what labels or categorizations. That's where you know the supervised learning and things like that. So that's kind of at a very high level, uh, the difference between AI and machine learning. Uh, 
Okay, I think we're kind of getting, and where can we use deep learning? So deep learning is, would be a good example of, you know, that the alpha go fight, uh, the dog fight simulation, right? Where we actually seeing the machines learning, but now the machines are learning on their own, depending on the variables and the factors kind of it fed, as well as it's using algorithms and supervised learning models that it has been taught over time. So it kind of goes a little bit more deeper. In fact, uh, you know, anything to do with neural network learning, that's kind of how we, you know, our nervous system, we learn based on reactions to our senses. We're kind of putting that in system. So that's a little bit of how deep learning is coming to play. Um, let's see. What's the difference between AI and cognitive computing? Great question. So, uh, you know, if I were to kind of break it down, cognitive is really the, the process of thinking that logic, right? If you're gonna allow that thinking to be in AI, we are kind of going into the realm of machine learning, it's kind of very similar. But if you just give machines some algorithms and based on the algorithms, it gives you outputs, and there's not much so much of thinking, but it's more of the telling. So that's kind of the difference between AI and your cognitive computing. Uh, Shabir, I think with uh, eight minutes over, um... Uh, maybe we can follow up with the remaining yeah, questions yeah. on the, uh, as we put it out there, the Google forum. Um, yeah. uh, and we're very happy. And again, it's not just Shabir and Faisal here speaking, but the whole alumni uh, group uh, is here to support you. The, this is a topic where a lot of the alumni are, are actively engaged in. So we can uh, both have a conversation and have more meaningful outcomes as well as we proceed. Um, yes, sir. Yeah. Um, great. Uh, so before we close up, uh, I'll just request uh, Professor Chaya here uh, from uh, our campus here to so just uh, present a brief vote of thanks. Uh, over to you, Professor Chaya. Uh, we can't hear you. You're not audible, Professor Chaya. Hello. Yes, 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 you are, yes, you are audible now, yes. A uh, uh, very good evening to all, sir. I, Chaya Ravindra, on behalf of Anjuman Islam Kalsikar Technical Campus and Sabah Saddik, it's indeed a privilege and pleasure to propose a vote of thanks on a concluding end of the webinar entitled Making AI the use, uh, Real, the Use Case of Applied AI. It was indeed one of the enriching experience to all of the participants, sir. First and foremostly, I am thankful to Mr. Shabir Burma and Mr. Faisal uh, for being truly knowledgeable and resourceful, resourceful speaker. You have impressed the participants and ignited the minds, sir. Thank you very much, sir. And thank you so much for providing the resource for learning AI by using the app you have given with the, the code and all. And it's insight for, uh, and for today's insight for uh, webinars, today's webinar. I must thank to our management for a generous support to continuously throughout the carry out this webinar. And I also thank, extend my deep uh, sense of gratitude to both of the directors, Vasabha uh, Siddiq and as well as our uh, directors, sir, Dr. Abdul Raza Kunotagi, sir, and uh, Dr. Mohideen Ahmed, sir, for providing encouragement and support. I would like to thank our coordinator, Dr. Sharik, sir, and all our faculty participants uh, for making this event or uh, the webinar successful. Finally, I would like to thank our wonderful students who have turned up in the great number to make this uh, event a great success. Thank you so much, sir, and wish you all the safe time ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you, Professor Thank you, Professor uh, 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 and, and Shabir Bhai, once again. I think the students really enjoyed the session. Um, and as, as you mentioned, I think we will continue to have this conversation going yeah. on. Um, with their faculty and with the students um, in, in form of uh, in projects, in terms of uh, any other guidance that we'd have. I think this is just a start of that conversation and, and definitely that would be enriching uh, and faculty would definitely benefit uh, from the experience, real life experience that you guys have been working on, both yourself and Shabir. Um, so thank you once again from all of us here in India. Um, uh, and hopefully we'll, we'll follow up with another uh, session on AI and, and something exciting soon, inshallah. Thank you. Thank inshallah, you once again. Thank you. Thank Thanks you so much. much. Thank you. Thank you, Shabir.